difficult to define. If I were going to ask you to draw a picture of trust, that would be a difficult thing to do. I mean, some of us would say, well, I can't draw a picture of anything, so let alone something that's hard to define. But if you were to, to try to define what trust means, I mean, trust is one of those things that kind of we know when we see it, we know when we experience, we know when we don't have it. But if we were going to define trust, that's difficult to do. It's easy to lose trust. It can be very difficult to earn trust. It's hard to define. So who do you trust? And why do you trust them? Your list of all of the people that you trust, is it a long list? Or is it a short list? Do you find it easy to trust people? Do you give your trust quickly? Or does the person have to earn it? How do you trust? Who do you trust? Why do you trust? How do you define trust? What I want to take the next few moments, and I just kind of want us to look at this idea of trust and see if we can see if we can get a definition and see if we can set up to see uh, what trust is. Trust really depends on several factors. And I could just use me as an example. My name is Marty Williams. And I can ask you, I don't want anybody to answer or shout out or anything, but if, if I were just to say, okay, do you trust me? Trust, the trust that you place in someone, the trust that you place in an object or a thing depends on some things. And here's some of the factors that I think that it depends on. The first thing it depends on is how well do you know what you're trusting? If you know me very well, that may, that may mean you trust me. That also may mean you don't trust me. Because if you were to ask my wife, does she trust if I'm going to dispose of the crumbs on the counter in a proper manner? She does not trust me to do that. Because she knows my manner. That's what we do with crumbs. We have a dog. So how you trust someone, one of the factors is how well do you know it. And sometimes the more you get to know a person, the more your trust does what? It increases. Sometimes the more you get to know someone, your trust does what? decreases. So the, the level of, the, of your knowledge of the person or the object uh, ha, is a factor in, in trust. Another thing is what's at stake. If I were to ask you to trust me with $10, most of you would. If I were to ask you to trust me with $1,000, some of you would. If I were to ask you to trust me with $10,000, Almost none of you would. If I were to ask you to trust me with $100,000, you see what happens there? What's at stake determines the trust factor. If there's not a lot at stake, then it's easy to trust. If there's an awful lot at stake, then the trust and the trust that I have in somebody um, or something definitely plays a role. So how long or how well you know the, the, the person matters, what's at stake matters, and then the circumstances matter. If, if, if I were to ask you to come down and stand in the front, and, and I was going to get behind you, and I was just going to gently place my hands on your back, and just kind of lean into you just a little bit, right down here on the front of the, right down here in front, that would not be a big deal, right? There would be no, I mean, that would be easy to trust me. Now, let's let our minds all go to the edge of the Grand Canyon. And you're standing on the very edge of the Grand Canyon. And I walk up behind you and say, well, first of all, if I walk up behind you, you probably are going to step back. <laughs> and if I say, no, I need you to stay there because I'm going to come up behind you and I'm going to place my hands, my two hands on your back. The circumstances matter, don't they? So if the circumstances change, then my trust changes. So how well I know somebody or don't know, doesn't know someone matters. Another factor is what's at stake. Another fact is the circumstances. So how do I trust? How do you trust if something's real? How do you trust if something uh, is meaningful? I think the, the first thing that we almost automatically run to when it comes to trust is what, are, what do other people say? 
we have TripAdvisor, and we have this, and we have that. We have all of these things. And, and when we get somebody else's opinion, what are we doing? We're building a case for whether or not we're going to stay at that hotel, or we're going to eat at that restaurant, or we're going to send our kids to that school, or we're going to attend that church, or we're going to buy this car. Whatever it is, whatever decision that we're trying to make, one of the things that we almost immediately go to is, what is everybody else doing? What does everybody else say? What are the people who have tried this or trusted this, what did they say? So a lot of times we will trust other people's word before we will trust anything else. Uh, the second thing that, that comes into play when we trust is, is the idea of, of I have to test it. You know, I, I, I test if you've driven a certain car and you've had it for a long time and it's been very faithful and you've never had any problems with it, you're more likely to do what? Buy that car again. Because you've tested it. You know it to be true. So we take other people's word when we trust and, we, and then we test. And then sometimes in order for us to trust, uh, it, it doesn't really matter what everybody else is saying and I really haven't had the opportunity to test it. So in order for me to trust, I'm just going to simply have to take a risk. Some of you are attending church here for the first time today, so you've taken a risk. You took a risk to come in. Everybody in the room at one point in time had your first Sunday here, and you took a risk. So there are things that we do when it comes to trust. How well do I know the person? What's at stake? What are the circumstances? What are other people saying? Have I tested it? Am I willing to take a risk? Well, we're in a series that we're calling Courage, where we're looking at this idea of courage. And courage to do the hard thing. Courage to say the hard thing. Uh, courage to do the difficult thing. And we're taking different characters from the Bible and looking at their stories. And today we're looking at the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we've read their story. Their story is found in the book of Daniel chapter 3. And I just kind of want to repeat the story this morning before we, get, before we go any far, further. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are Jews, and they're part of the nation of Israel. Like I said, their story is in, found in the book of Daniel. You have to go back to the beginning, of the, the beginning of the Bible. We have the garden, and then we have the fall, and then we have the flood, Noah and the flood. And then God calls Abraham, and then Abraham has a son, Isaac, and Isaac has a son, Jacob. And Jacob has a bunch of sons. One of them is Joseph, not the Joseph, not Jesus' father, earthly father, but the Old Testament Joseph. And they end up going down into Egypt, and then they're slaves in Egypt, and then the, the great prophet Moses comes along, and they're delivered, the nation of Israel is delivered out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, they go into the desert, they, they're at the foot of Mount Sinai, they receive this thing that everybody knows about called the Ten what? Commandments. Ten Commandments, so they receive these Ten Commandments. And then they end up going into the Promised Land after 40 years, and they set up their kingdom, and once they set up their kingdom, we get their first king, Saul, who didn't really work. And then we get David, who kind of worked, but did some, some dumb stuff along the way. And then we have Solomon, which is the height of the kingdom. And then there's a civil war after Solomon, and there's different kings and different things that are going, that, that are going on. And the nation of Israel repeatedly would turn its back on God. Regardless of what God did for them, regardless of what God promised them, but regardless of how God judged them, they, would, they kept repeating the same process of turning their back on God. And in this process, they had turned their back on God, and the Babylonians had captured them. And in the process of capturing Israel, uh, what King Nebuchadnezzar did, and was very common in the day, is they took the best of the best of the best back home. They left the loser, so to speak, to stay in the land. But they took the best of the best of the best back uh, to Babylon. And it was very common in the day. If you were the best of the best of the best, it didn't really matter where you're from. If you're the best of the best of the best, then you have the ability, you have a responsibility to do something. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, and, and some of us know the story of Daniel in the lion's den. That happens later in the book of Daniel. Some of you know the story that happens before this where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, are, are told they're going to have to eat the king's food and drink the king's wine. And Daniel steps up and says, no, we're not going to do that. Can we do this? And test the staff for 40 days. And, and there's that whole story. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the best of the best of the best. And they are in powerful positions within Babylon, Babylon even though they are Jews. And when you read the story, and you read the story slowly, 
You see there's some jealousy there. You see there's some different things that are going on. And so we come to this story that we find in chapter 3, where King Nebuchadnezzar makes this huge statue of himself. And then he tells the whole land that whenever the band starts to play, you've got to bow and worship me. And so they do this. The band starts to play and everybody bows and worships. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do not. And then the people who are jealous do what? They tattletale. They tattletale on them and they go to King Nebuchadnezzar and say, Hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow. And so the king brings them before the king. And, and they have this conversation. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, We're not going to bow. Because our God's going to deliver us. And there's this furnace, this form of execution. And, and so uh, the king gets really, really mad. And he has them thrown into the furnace. And as the king's watching the three men that are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown in the furnace... It's so hot, even some of the guards who threw them in die, just throwing them in the furnace. And, and the king says, wait, didn't we throw three in? So why is there four? And why does he seem like a god? Now, in the, just very briefly in the story of Scripture, in the story of God's story, the fourth person is commonly to believe to be Jesus. And they're walking around in the fire. And I wonder what they're talking about. <laughs> I wonder if Shadrach said, you must know as hot in here as I thought. <laughs> I wonder if Jesus asked them if they were ready to go home. I wonder if Jesus gave them a notch. Because they were walking around. I wonder if Jesus said, guys, you want to go back and see if you can make a difference here in Babylon or just, just want to go with me? Or maybe Jesus does he tend to, doesn't tend to ask those kind of questions. Maybe he just said, hey, listen, guys, you know, I know you expected to be able to go home now, but you're actually going to have to go back. And here's why. So the king calls them out with the fire and proclaims God and gives them a promotion. Not what uh, the guys who did this wanted to hear. So, what does that have to do with courage? Uh, really, before we can talk about courage... And as we talk about courage and it as it relates to trust, we need to deal with the elephant in the room. Does anybody know what the elephant in the room is? Well, let me tell you what the elephant in the room is. Martin, that sounds like a fairy tale, not a real life story. That sounds like a Disney cartoon, not a real life story. Marty, you're telling me that you actually believe this happened. So this is the elephant in the room. Okay? Now for some of you, that's not the elephant in the room. There's another elephant in the room. We'll have to talk about it another time. But for some of you, that's the big, big, giant elephant in the room. Are you presenting this story as fact? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. But I'm presenting it as fact. But you may not be there. So that leads us to our first point this morning. The first point is this. It takes courage to trust the Scripture. It takes courage to trust the Scripture. Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in this predicament. They're in this ability. They're about to be thrown into a furnace. Why? Because they did not obey the law of the land. They did not follow the king's orders to worship a graven image of himself. Now, why did they choose not to do this? <laughs> because they have been taught that there is only one God. They have been taught that you can't have any other idols. They have been taught that you don't bow to a graven image. The fact that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in Babylon was because the nation of Israel had disobeyed these commands. And God punished them by sending the Babylonians to capture them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in this mess because they actually believe the Ten Commandments. They actually believe the Ten Commandments. They actually believe that God wrote them down, put them on some stones, and said, Don't have any other gods before me. Do not worship a graven image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego actually 
believed this. They believed this to the point they were willing to do what? Put their life on the line. So they believed the Scripture. It takes courage to believe the Scriptures. All of them. If I were going to offer you a big old glass of iced tea, but I put a thimble full of sewage in it, you're still going to drink it? It's, it's mostly tea. <laughs> 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 In fact, it's like 95% tea. You still going to drink it? No. It takes courage to believe Scripture. It takes courage to see that the Bible is the written Word of God and that we're actually supposed to obey it. This takes courage. Now, some people will say, and maybe you will say, Marty, it doesn't take courage to believe the Scripture. It takes stupidity. It doesn't take courage to believe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story. That takes ignorance. Because how can that be true? Well, if the God of the universe created fire. Do you think he can control it? If the God of the universe built the universe, if he created water, if water was his idea, do you think he could walk on it if he wanted to? I'm amazed by this. Now, you may be amazed that I believe in the miracles that are in the Scriptures. I'm amazed that people who say they believe in God and believe that He created everything and then He had hung up on a miracle. That amazes me. Well, do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? Because if He rose from the dead, keeping three Hebrew guys from burning up in a furnace, furnace it is doable. <laughs> And if you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead, that's ultimately your problem. Not the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego believed the scriptures. When God said, don't do this, they said, they, hey, we're not going to do this. So the question that I ask you this morning is, do you trust the Bible? And if you don't, What are you trusting? What are you betting on? Who's got a better offer? And if you trust the Bible, you have to trust all of them. It's an important question. And it takes a lot of courage to trust the Scriptures. The second thing is this. It takes courage to trust God. I want to give a definition of, of what it means to trust God. Here, here's, a, here's a basic definition. It's kind of a simple definition of what it means to trust God. Because trusting God takes a lot of courage. Trust is resting in the belief that God is who He says He is and He will do what He says He will do. Rest, trust is resting in the belief that God is who He says He is. And He will do what He says He will do. So when God says, I will bless you for this behavior then I trust that He's going to do that. When God says, I'm going to judge you because of this behavior, then I have to trust this, that I believe what He says. And when He says, do this, I should do this. And when He says, don't do this, I shouldn't do that. It's, it's a trust factor. And if I can rest, trust is resting in a belief that God is who He says He is, and He will do what He says He will do. And we see this in this story, and we have this, put this scripture up. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply. After Nebuchadnezzar said to them, you're going to have to bow, or I'm going to throw you in the furnace. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Now that, we can stop right there. Okay, because that's huge. I don't need your validation, king. I don't need your validation, 
best friend. I don't need your validation, dad. I don't need your validation, daughter. I don't need your validation, boss. I don't need your... Va get the, you get the picture? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we didn't need to defend ourselves before you. If, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He is what? Able. able. He is what? Able. able. He's what? Able. able. Are they saying he will? No. He's able to save us. And then they say, he will rescue us from your power, your majesty. <laughs> And I believe when they're saying he will rescue us from your power, they don't know how he's going to do it. And they may be saying, you know what? Our earthly life may be about to end. Because that furnace looks really, really hot. <laughs> and if that's how God chooses to rescue me, fantastic. Now, let, me, let me give you a truth. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ. If you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and he's given you that promise when you place your faith in him. Now, this is going to be shocking. Death is the best thing that will ever happen to you. Death is the best thing that will ever happen to you. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Leonard are saying, hey, the God we serve is able to save us. And he will rescue us from your power and your ministry. But And I love this. This is my favorite thing in the whole Bible. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, <laughs> that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Now that's trust. And that's confidence. And that's saying, this is who we are, and I believe. God will deliver us. He's able to do it. But even if he doesn't, I want to make it clear to you that we will not serve your God, and we will not bow to your image. Because trusting God takes courage, and this is why it takes courage. Because when you trust God based on his written word, because that's how we know God's story, when we trust God, you are going to find yourself in incredibly difficult situations. Incredibly difficult situations. So the question becomes, do I rest in the trust I say I have in God? As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are saying it very boldly here. So the third and last point is this. It takes, takes trust to trust the scripture. It takes trust to trust God. And then third one, it takes courage to trust God no matter what. To trust God no matter what. There's three things we teach our children. I love this, and I wish us adults would get it straight. There's three things. <laughs> Treat others the way you want to be treated. Make wise choices. And trust God no matter what. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Make wise choices. And trust God no matter what. That's what our children are being taught every week in the back. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Make wise choices. Trust God no matter what. Now the no matter what is the deal. Because this is the part of the story where, where it really hits. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. You know what this is like, right? Yeah, when somebody's really mad, do you ever wonder, I wonder if he's mad. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if she's mad. Hmm, I'm trying to figure out if she's mad. No, we know. We can read it on your face, okay? He's distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to buy on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blank and serve them. Now try to play the movie, okay? They've made their statements. He's getting angry. You ever made a statement and then someone gets angry and then you backtrack your statement? Anybody ever done that? Have you ever made a statement, okay, I'm going to take some courage, and I'm going to make a stand, and I'm going to say something, and then they react and you back it up, right? You start backing up. Well, that's not exactly what I meant, and maybe we can 
And that's what happened. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in a spot where they can do that. They made their statement. They said, this is who we are. This is what we believe. He gets so mad, his face is so distorted. He calls the strongest men, the strongest men, get, that men, get this mental picture, right? Here's the big and the baddest and the strongest dudes are coming with the rope. They're tying them up. They're heating up the furnace. And you know what that's like. You've been at a concert and they think, you know, they're writing a song in the fire flame and you feel the heat. <laughs> they feel the heat. There's an opportunity here for them to do what? To say, hey, wait, we change our mind. We will bow. And, and, and it goes on. No, no, nothing. Okay, it's right there. And they begin to throw them into the furnace. Okay, well, what goes on is they, they bound them up and they throw them in the furnace. He trusts in God no matter what. This is, this is trusting God when the heat is on. Pun intended. I mean, the heat is on. I might lose my job if I stand for this. I might lose this relationship if I stand for this. I, I might... The heat is on. And because it's one thing to trust God in church. It's one thing to trust God here on Sunday morning. It's quite another to trust Him on Tuesday afternoon at work. That's why that's our mission statement. To live the truth of Jesus in everyday life. It's one thing to trust God and say all the church answers and say all the things in church on Sunday morning. It's another thing to live for Him on Friday night. That's why we say living the truth of Jesus in everyday life. Trusting God no matter what. Just real quick, I want to give you a couple of things on what it might look like to trust God no matter what. Trusting God no matter what means getting out of the moment and seeing the big picture. Getting out of the moment and seeing the big picture. How were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being able to do this? Well, they had trusted God in the past. He'd been delivered. Even though they'd been captured, you imagine them being captured and going through that whole process. They were captured. They were taken to a foreign land. And they find they were faithful to God. They trusted God. They, they remained faithful even through that whole process. And where do they find themselves? In leadership position in the enemy camp. This is not such a bad place to be in the enemy camp. It's a whole lot better to be in a leadership position in the enemy camp than being in the prison of the enemy camp. So God has taken care of them, and they've seen that, and they've gotten out of the moment. If they got caught up in the moment of the furnace, they would have bowed. If they had only been focusing on the furnace, they would have bowed. If they would have been only focused on the furnace and their faith of, and their fear of death, and them not really believing that the best thing that ever happened to them as followers of God is their death. If they had got caught up in the moment, they would have sinned. If they had got caught up in the moment, they would have missed this opportunity. And if I'm going to trust God no matter what, I've got to train myself and I've got to practice. I cannot get caught up in the moment. I have to look. I must look at the big picture. Because you can win the argument and lose the relationship. You can have what you think is a great weekend and destroy your marriage. By getting caught up in the moment. And if I'm going to trust God no matter what, I've got to see the big picture. And I can't just get caught up in the moment. Living in the here and now will destroy your soul. Living in the here and now will destroy your soul. Second thing, realizing there is nowhere else to go. How do I trust God no matter what? I realize there is nowhere else to go. And this happens all the time. And you know how this happens. If somebody gets really sick or something really goes bad or something's in life is really terrible and then people who don't even know God, don't even profess to believe in God and will take your what? Prayers. And there's an old saying from World War II, there's no atheists in foxholes. When the bombs are coming in and people are shooting at you, it's oh God. Like, oh God, get me out of here. And the sooner I can get to the place where I realize there is no place to go other than God, that's going to help me trust Him no matter what. 
So I got to get out of the moment. And I got to trust him as I'm trusting him. No matter what, if I get out of the moment, focus on the big picture. And if I can, if I can realize that, hey, there's nowhere else for me to go. Trusting God takes courage. It takes God, it takes, it takes trust. It takes courage to trust God's scripture. Especially the parts you really don't want to believe. Especially the parts that have to force you to change your lifestyle. That's the part we really don't want to hear that part. But to trust God no matter what, I've got to trust the scriptures and that takes courage. I've got to trust God. God puts, God puts some action to it. And I've got to trust Him no matter what, even when He is turned up. I'm going to close by reading from Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. And, and this is the prophet Isaiah, and he is writing to the children. He's writing to the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel in this moment, where they're in the moment, they're, they're not looking at the big picture, they're in the moment. They're in the moment. They're up in Friday night. And they're up in this. And they're in the moment. They're in the art. They're in the moment. They're not looking at the big picture. And Isaiah is saying, listen, if you do not repent, if you do not turn to God, if you don't stop the way that you're living, if you don't do this, then bad things are going to happen. Countries like Babylon are going to come in and destroy you and take the best of the best of the best. If the best of the best of the best of your country is not in your country, what shape is your country in? Bad shape, because you've got losers running everything. That wasn't really a statement. <laughs> but this is what happens. When the best of the best no longer run for Congress. When the best of the best no longer run for the Senate. When the best of the best choose to make as much money as possible instead of leading their country. See, these are the things that happen. And Isaiah is saying... If you don't, you've got to get this. And this is what he says. He says, this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, i.e. God, says. In repentance, and repentance means what? To turn, to do a 180, not a 360. Because if you do a 360, you just end up right where you started. In repentance, you do a 180, you change direction and rest in your salvation. I believe all my heart, I, when I played the movie of Shadrach, Meshach, and Bethlehem, standing before the king, I think they're at complete peace. So I think they're resting in who God is. And what God has said he's going to do. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and what? Trust, Trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Are you at your trust? Even if it means changing your lifestyle? You trust even when it hurts? Or do you have none of it? Pray with me. Father God, we give this to you. We give our time to you. Your truth that's been, that we've read and we've sung about truth and we've prayed truth and hopefully we've talked truth. We ask that you help us to have the courage that we need to trust you, no matter what. In your name we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand?